You're listening to the official South Bay Church podcast. For more about us, please visit southbaychurch.us. And that's uh, what you call a heavenly hoedown right there. And uh, great to be together. Uh, as uh, Andy said, it's kind of an interesting weekend. You know, the emotions go different directions and things. But, uh, you know, it's one of those times where you want to be together. So it's great to be together to see everybody. And uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, as Andy mentioned, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's been a tough time. But, uh, but it's a great time to have you with us. We're just finishing a, a new seri- a series that we've been doing the last six, uh, six weeks called Travel Light. And it's so appropriate, you know, to have been talking about this. But the whole idea of the series is is that we journey with all this baggage. Uh, We journey with all this luggage sometimes. And uh, and God wants us not to be so burdened and not to be so weighed down as we're on this journey. And the scripture that that, uh, Sean read during uh, during communion, I want to look at a, a different translation of it than maybe the one we're as familiar with in the New Living Translation. It says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you are in a race. Sometimes we don't want to be. We go, I want to take a break. I don't want to be in a race. I want to be on vacation. We don't have a choice. You know, you're in that race. And it says here that we are designed, God wants us to strip off every weight that slows us down. So many of us are running the race, carrying all this baggage. And so I hope as we've gone through this series, it's helped you to uh, be able to release some of those burdens, the burdens of worry or anxiety or a, a lack of forgiveness, or, or you know, mistrust, or sin, you know, that, that just keeps us from being all that God wants us to be. And the title of the lesson today is Finishing Strong. Finishing Strong. Finishing is what it's all about if you're in a race. You know, anybody can start, but not everybody can finish. That's true of a lot of endeavors. I mean, anybody can start school Anybody can start a master's program. Anybody can start, you know, some new project. But it's all about finishing. Jesus told a story of a guy who was building this tower. And all his neighbors were like, wow, he's going to build this awesome tower. And then he ran out of money and he, and he never completed it. You got, anybody seen those kind of projects in your neighborhood sometimes? You know, when are they going to finish that? You know, because they, it started and then there's nobody there for months and then years. And there's one of those in my neighborhood. I think about that verse all the time. In the story Jesus told, he says that the neighbors all say, this fellow began to build, but what? Was unable to finish. And Jesus says, that's not the way to live the Christian life. If you're going to follow me, he says, you've got to count the cost. Because there is a cost to following Jesus. In fact, Jesus says in that same passage, Luke 14, if you want to be my follower, great. You must give up everything you have. That's pretty hardcore, right? What does he mean? Does he mean we all need to be, you know, homeless people uh, preaching Jesus? No, he means that everything, you relinquish all that ownership to Christ. You make him Lord of everything, your schedule, your time, your money, your your emotions, your your past, your future, your present. He is Lord of your life if you're a real disciple. You give it all to him. and, and And so you count that cost. But finishing is everything. You know, those of you who've been around a long time, you know, it. It's not like, you know, when you get baptized, you're all excited. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to help 18 people become Christians this year. I remember this one guy uh, baptizing him when I was in college. He's like, yeah, I'm going to help 18 people become Christians this year. It's like, amen, let's do it. But, you know, then he's not around like four years later. You know, that's what happens sometimes. And so it's all about finishing. It's all about enduring. It's all about making it to the end. And how you finish is really important. You guys remember uh, in the Olympics when Michael Phelps lost that race because of the finish? I got a clip of it here. Halfway through the race, Phelps turned first so Phelps ahead of the South the African, Chad Lacoste, who won right five medals at the Youth Olympic Games. Down the stretch, right Phelps trying to hold on, but his glide into Phelps the finish won. opened the door for the South African to win gold. So Phelps was in the lead right there to the end, but that one last, Lacoste, see there, there it is, that one, his first Phelps glided medal, in, finishing five and the, the other dude from Phelps. South Africa took one more stroke, and he, and he won the gold. 
And it was, you know, it was only inches difference. And so finishing is really, really important. And, and, and what does it mean to finish spiritually? What does that mean to finish strong spiritually? You ever kind of think about that? I mean, times like this make you think about that. Uh, you know, what is life really about? What really matters? I can remember in my own life, the first time really thinking deeply about that. I was 16 years old and uh, I was at my, on my parents' uh, front porch and, uh, you know, we've been studying things in, 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 uh, in high school about stars and, and the galaxies and how far away they were. And I remember looking at the Big Dipper. You can kind of see the Big Dipper there. And, and we learned about how far away some of those stars were. I don't even remember now, but they're billions and billions of light years away. And I remember just thinking that that light hitting my eyes right now, th- those, those photons of light, you know, that left that star billions of years ago. That I, and I'm just now seeing the light from that star. And I remember going, and I'm 16. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, we're set, I'm studying ancient history and ancient civilizations and things from 10,000 years ago. And I'm going, I'm 16 years old. You know, and if I'm lucky, I live to 80. That is nothing. That is nothing. And I remember just feeling so small, but kind of feeling like, yeah, but God loves me, you know? And and just kind of, that was the first, it was a deep thought for being 16, you know, and I was kind of proud of myself. And <laughs> I was, uh, I was reminded of this because uh, I was at youth camp a couple weeks ago and uh, it was an awesome time together. And one of the things, one of the most special times at youth camp is the Starlight Devotional. And Starlight Devotional, all the kids, all the campers, 400 people, all in total silence, leave the, this amphitheater where we meet to worship and we all go out to this field that's this kind of remote field and uh, used to be, now there's events out there, but used to be, there was nothing else that happened in that field. So I remember the first time going out there, you don't even know where you're being taken because you're just kind of led in the dark to this field. And everybody lies down in silence and you look up at the stars and a brother leads you in a devotional as we're all looking at the stars. And you know, this is out in Idlewild, so it's away from the lights. And so it's where you can see just the sky is full of stars and you see falling stars and uh, it's so cool. So I was lying there looking at the stars and as he's talking, I was thinking about being 16. And, and, and I, I was thinking of those, those, you know, those same stars that I was looking at when I was 16. And I was thinking about it because my son was there as a, as a, as a helper, a gopher, and he's 16 now. And so I was thinking about what, what is he thinking about during the, and you know, when you're a parent of a 16 year old, you can't talk to him too much about that stuff, you know? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, they're, they're on their own now, sort of in their spiritual quest. I mean, you try to, but you know, but I was thinking, what is he thinking? You know, as the guy's talking, what is he thinking of as he looks at those stars? Is he thinking about his future? Is he thinking about his, uh, you know, and the guy's talking about pick a star and make a, you know, make a prayer to God and, 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 and you know, between you and God. So I was thinking, what is he thinking? And, and, uh, and, and it, was, it was crazy because there's 400 people, they're all lying on our backs, and then we all get up to leave, and Jameson was right next to me in the dark. I didn't even know he was there. I had come out, you know, later and just happened to lie down beside. I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, one of those cool little things that God does. Like, oh, that's cool, God. I was praying about him. He's right there. And, uh, you know, I tried, like I said, I tried not to not talk to him too much about it. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, thinking about the big picture is so important. And this, this psalm that we've been using, Psalm 23, as our, for the series, we've been going one verse at a time. So we, we, we went through, if you can see on the screen, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. So that lesson was running scared, how we, we, we get afraid because we th- think we're missing out, we need more, we need more, and, 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 and realize that, no, we, I have all I need. Number two, he lets me rest in green meadows, he leads me beside peaceful streams. Uh, that passage uh, talked about uh, not so fast, like slow down. God wants you to have peace. God leads us to peaceful streams, he lets you rest. You know, God, we're in a race, but God also protects our souls and you find rest for your soul. Number three, he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Mark Steberg preached about seeing through the fog. God leads us through the fog. He guides us on the right path. It's it's a challenging path. It's a different path than what the world wants to lead you on. Uh, Number verse four, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid and your staff protect and comfort me. Jim Malin talked about when we're in hard times, when we're in the dark passageways, we're in the dark valleys, when our life is wrecked, that God is still with with us. He still guides us through all of that. Uh, 
Verse 5, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. And he talked about how God wants to prepare a feast for you. God wants to set a place at the table for you. Our lives are full. You know, we, we, uh, the, the title of the lesson was Juggling Act because we feel like we're trying to juggle all these things. And God just wants us to, to stop worrying about all that and just know that he's got, he's got us covered. He's got to take care of us. So then I love how David really finishes out by looking forward. We're talking about thinking strong. He looks forward and he says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So that's what we're going to talk about today is finishing strong. You know, he says that your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. I have three points here. Uh, forward. Focus. And forever. Focus, forward, focus, and forever. So forward, you know, he says that it's weird that he kind of changes the the, 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 the the scenario a little bit. Like up to this point, he says, you're the shepherd and you're leading me. You lead me to paths. You lead me here. You, you know, but now he switches it, right? He says, your goodness and unfailing love will follow me or will pursue me. So now God is behind us. We kind of move forward and he's behind us. It's kind of interesting sort of poetic device that David uses there. Like God is immovable. God is forever. God is, and we kind of move through him in time. But I love that that, that image of God's unfailing love will pursue you. You know, remember the stories that Jesus told about the shepherd and the sheep and how even if there's 99 good sheep and they're, they're doing what they need to do and one strays away what does the shepherd do he leaves the 99 in the fold or safely and he goes and finds the one that's the kind of god that we serve that god will pursue you by his love so what that tells me is i've got to never quit i've got to never reject his love even when i feel like i have gotten way off off track i've got to trust that he he still has a plan for me he's going to pursue me by his love his love is unfailing that verse says and so he doesn't give up on us and he keeps pursuing us and I like the picture of, any dad here remembers this. Uh, does my clicker stop working? There we go. Remember, remember running behind your kid when they're learning to, to ride a bike? And you're pursuing them, right? Because they're riding the bike and <laughs> you keep going. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're running behind them and you catch them if they fall and you're running right behind them and you're cheering them on. You know, that's the image I have of God pursuing us with his love as we're moving that's the kind of God that we serve and that's the kind of love that we have that means even if you are wrecked fallen faithless doubtless doubtful rather in sin God still has a plan for you we all mess up we all fall into sin sin is missing the mark is what it literally means hamartia it means to miss the mark it's an archery term there's the goal and you go and you shoot your arrow way over there you totally missed it and, and, and we all do it. So it's a matter of going, okay, I got to repent. I got to get back on track. And God is pursuing you there with his love. So that is so important that you believe that because that's what's going to affect your future. If you believe God just had to get me or God is against me or God is just waiting for me to mess up so he can squash me, then, then what Satan tries to tell you is, well, you've, you've already messed up. So, you know, why even try? You might as well not even try. You've already, you've already ruined it. So just give up. You know, that's, that's always been how he operates. Uh, even in the garden, in the very beginning, God is trying to keep something from you, he told Adam and Eve. God doesn't want you to have what you could have. God wants to hold something back from you. And, and uh, I mean, I was just talking to a brother a couple of days ago who, who, who blew it with some sin. And, and, and those, those very voices were in his mind, oh, I've already done this, so I might as well do this. I'm not going to do that, but I've already, you know, that's how Satan does. And so he gets us to our hearts to get harder and harder. And it gets us to drift, 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 drift from God to where, where, where we're, we get too far gone. And so God, God is always saying, I'm going to pursue you. Just you got to get back on track and, and that will shape your future. Paul says this about God's love. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. Therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You know, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, 
but you are not living for Jesus, then I would venture to say you are not a follower of Jesus or you don't understand what he really did for you. Because this says that those who live for him, we don't live for ourselves anymore. Now we're tested with that every day, but it's a daily decision. That's why Jesus says you must give up everything you have, like I said earlier, or, or that's why he says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me because you go, okay, God, you've done so much for me. You love me so much. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for you. And, and that's the ultimate expression of God's love is what he did on the cross for us. So that focus is what keeps us going. Compels means leaves us no choice, moves us forward. It's like a, you know, a piston in a car. There's a little gas explosion and that piston just has to move. And that's what Christ's love does. I've got, to, I've got to serve him. I've got to move forward. I've got to give him my life because of what he has done for me. Second thing we're going to talk about is focus. Paul was very focused on the cross, and that's what kept him going. And if you're on a journey, knowing your destination is really important. You know, nobody goes, hey, we're going to go on vacation, and just gets in the car and just starts driving. You know, you, you, you have some idea of where you're headed. You have a focus on your destination. And yet so often spiritually, that's how people live their spiritual journey. Oh, I don't know. I'm sure it'll all work out. You know, they put all this research into what kind of car to buy or all this effort into, I'm thinking of getting solar panels and they'll investigate it for years, you know. But, but then when it comes to their spiritual future, it's like, I don't know, I'm sure it'll all work out. There's all kinds of paths to heaven and, you know, whatever. I mean, people are so ho-hum about it, and yet nothing's more important then your final destination, nothing is more important than your spiritual destination. And the finish line is so important. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know, that, and it says the sin that so easily entangles us. Why do we get tripped up? Because we lose our focus. I mean, most of the times I have tripped, it's because I wasn't watching where I was going. Right? Uh, have you guys seen, uh, my, my son Marshall showed me these, this video, uh, I want to show you guys here. It's a compilation video of people texting while walking. <laughs> that guy's texting while rollerblading. So, so, you know, we've, maybe you've seen those videos before. Um, I, I know it's bad to laugh at other people's expense, but <laughs> texting while you're rollerblading, though? I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> uh, while you're walking by a pool? I mean, what? Uh, but, but you know what? I thought that was such a metaphor for how we can be spiritually. You know, there's a big picture uh, of, of our spiritual destination or our spiritual journey and we're so focused on whatever it is we want right at that moment or whatever is consuming us right there that, that we lose focus of what really, really matters. And uh, the Hebrew writer says, so, so he says, we, we, we gotta, we, we're in a race, right? And he says, you gotta run with endurance and, and, and get rid of the things that entangle us. And then here's the next thought, Hebrews 12. We do this, we do what? We, we run that race, we, we run it with endurance. How do we do this? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. 
You know, he says the way that we run this race, the way that we stay on track is by keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. By looking at him and what he did and how he was focused forward. What does it say he was focused on? The joy set before him. Right? When, when he was in the midst of that suffering, those hard times, what, what made him get through? I mean, I can't imagine all that he went through. It was focusing on the future, focusing on the resurrection, focusing on uh, the kingdom to come, focusing on the, the fact that by his sacrifice, all nations would have hope of, of glory. And so we've got to, why do we try to run the race without focusing on him? Why do we try to do it by our own power? Why do we try to uh, figure it out on our own instead of constantly going back to looking at him? We had a, a, a regional service that uh, Greg Mretzky preached for us, and the title of his lesson was, You've Got a Friend. And so I asked him, oh, you want us to do the James Taylor song? And he's like, oh, yeah, love me some JT. I guess, I guess old people call him JT. But uh, <laughs> I'm not old. I'm not old. <laughs> I'm only 44. <laughs> so he goes, yeah, I love me some JT. So I tried to learn uh, the song. You know, you've got a friend listening to it. So I had it down, but it was kind of difficult. And then I thought I should just watch a video. So then I watched on YouTube a video of James Taylor playing it. And he was playing it in a different way than I would, had learned it. He was playing it with a capo. Guitar players know what I mean. And when I saw him play it, I was like, oh. That is so much easier than what I've been doing. It was like it just clicked, and then I could do everything he was doing. It's like, why didn't I look at him before? Uh, why didn't I look at James Taylor? And, and I think sometimes with Jesus, it's like we try to make it through and fight these battles without looking at him. And what does he do? How does he live his life? He is the champion, that verse says. He is the, uh, another translation says he is the pioneer, which means he went before us. Another translation says he's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the author of the book. So why do we look for, to other sources instead of him? That's where I'm headed. Now, now I, I want to talk specifically about looking at him when it comes to the resurrection. And so the last point is forever, finishing forever. We talked about uh, forward, we talked about focus, and now we're going to talk about forever. And the New Testament writers say that David was a prophet and so it's so interesting that he had this view of forever because eternity wasn't really fully formed in, in, in kind of the understanding of God's people at this time. David wrote this a thousand years before Jesus. But David still had this understanding. He says, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I will be with God forever. What does that mean that we are with God forever? You know, there's a, a kind of a popular thought in the Christian mindset especially the last hundred years ago or something that, that I have been realizing is not correct. And that is that we die and then our, we have our soul. And then the future in heaven is, is just souls. It's just kind of disembodied spirits. You know, our, our body dies and then we're just all spirits and we're with God, like kind of this ghostly existence or maybe sort of like, remember, I, I watched a lot of Star Trek back in the day and there's always... There's always the, uh, I know I am old, I, I admit it. But, uh, but there's always those beings that they've evolved beyond the need for the body, you know? So then there's just sort of this floating, ooh, you know, here. And, the, and they always have all the cool powers and stuff. But that's kind of what, what we think about when we think about heaven or the future, just kind of this disembodied bodied floating spirit, right? This sort of, this ghostly existence. And yet that's not actually what you read about in Scripture, and, and, and so we're going to look at that. You know, the, 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 the Bible actually talks a lot about it. But the fact is, we don't talk a lot about it, I think, because we don't understand it. What we do understand is what you do and what you don't do. You know, there's a saying in the Bible, in the Bible Belt, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang around with girls that do. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how we look at Christianity. You know, like, I got to don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Instead of Christianity is supposed to be good news that there is a future that's coming and there is Jesus is coming back and there is a resurrection from the dead and you can be forgiven of all your sins and be able to live a bodily existence with God forever. And Paul and Peter both talk about it a lot. Um, preparing this lesson, I was like, man, this is in almost every New Testament uh, book this idea of a bodily resurrection and, and, a, and a new heaven and a new earth. 
Uh, I think part of the, another reason we don't understand it well or talk about it a lot is we're so time oriented. And especially in our generation, you know, we, and, and here in America, everybody's got a watch, everybody's, everything is on a schedule. We're very, very conscious of time. Even right now in other cultures, like I'm reading this book, mis, mis, misquoting scripture with Western eyes, the idea of like when we're Westerners, we, we view everything a certain way. And the author talks about how in, in Eastern countries, time is very different. And, and even how long something will take. Or, you know, if you hire a handyman, he might just come and live with you for who knows how long, you know, because however long it takes to get it done. You know, like there's not with us, everything is time and scheduled. And, you know, even just myself going down to Guadalajara, you know, it's kind of it's different. You know, you, you, you have an event and you start it whenever it starts and it ends whenever it ends and you eat whenever all that's over. It might be 9, 30, 10 at night. You know, there's it's just kind of a different flow of time. Than, than Los Angeles people are used to. And everything is so time sensitive. And, uh, and, and, and yet time is a part of this creation. So whatever the new creation is, time is, is all up in the air as far as how that's even going to work. And uh, I, read the, uh, I found this quote from uh, this, this guy named Arthur Custance. He's a Canadian scientist and also a Bible scholar. And listen to what he says about a large number versus infinity. Because he says, it's kind of like trying to understand forever is kind of like trying to reconcile time, uh, a large number with infinity. And he says, it's really important to notice that time stands in the same relation to eternity in one sense as a large number does to infinity. There is one sense in which infinity includes a very large number, yet it is quite fundamentally different and independent of it. And by analogy, eternity includes time and yet is fundamentally something other. The reduction of time until it gets smaller and smaller is still not eternity, nor do we reach eternity by, by an extension of time to great length. There is no direct pathway between time and eternity. There are different categories of experience. So now we all, we all go like this and we go... I imagine that's what uh, Arthur Custance looks like there. But, you know, it kind of mind blowing. But, but the idea is that, OK, I just don't get it. The time aspect of it. I don't understand. It's beyond me to understand. But here's something that we can understand. And remember, we said we got to fix our eyes on Jesus. We can understand who Jesus was when he rose from the dead. We can't understand that because because we have stories about that. And there's a lot of stories about that. Um, you know, about who he was and what he, what he, what he was like when he raised. Because the thing is, as Paul says, look, look at this verse, Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. You know, again, the Bible doesn't teach that we're just floating spirits in heaven someday. The Bible teaches that we will have bodies and that they will be like his body. And so what was his body like? Uh, Luke 24, it's one of my favorite passages. Uh, if you go ahead and turn over there, if you would, if you have a, uh, have a Bible with you. One of my favorite, uh, we don't have time to go all th through it, but it starts with, uh, you know, Jesus has, is risen from the dead. Uh, some of the women see him. And then there's this great story where these two guys are walking uh, from, from Jerusalem to this city called Emmaus. And as they're walking along, Jesus is walking with them and he kind of messes with them a little bit. And it's sort of like undercover boss, you know, where the undercover boss is kind of messing with the person to kind of see what they think or what they feel. And, and it's a great story. I really encourage you to read it on your own. And this is not a legend. Like we know the guy's name. Uh, his name was Cl Cleopas, was one of the guys. Th this is not, you know, sometimes people say, well, the resurrected Jesus is something that grew up over over you know, many hundreds of years and was kind of added in later. But the fact is that the earliest fragments of New Testament passages create, have the, 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 the stories about him risen from the dead. It was very, very, very early, and it, it was not legend. You know, this is a, a guy that's in the church, Cleopas. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, Dave Atkins, you know, a few years ago. You know, he's right here. He, he, if it was not true, he would tell you. No, that didn't happen. You know, this is a guy that was in the church, 
It's telling the story. So they, they see Jesus and he interacts with them. It's really cool. Then they're explaining to the group of, uh, of disciples who are gathered. And they're gathered with locked doors because they're afraid of the authorities. They've just killed their guy, their, their leader. And so they're afraid. So they're meeting in secret. They're meeting behind locked doors. And then suddenly Jesus is there. Verse 36, Luke 24, 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. No, duh. I mean, you're meeting, you're in quiet, secret. They're telling you, you're not believing them, of course. You just thought it was Jesus. That's ridiculous. Boom, Jesus is suddenly there. Jesus' resurrected body, he was able to go through matter or transcend matter or something. You know, he was able to just suddenly be there. You know, uh, I, I, I listened to a speaker who, uh, Timothy, uh, what's his name? Keller, yeah, who said that the tomb, uh, the, the stone was rolled away. We always think that the stone was rolled away so Jesus could get out. No, no. it was rolled that way so they could get in, right? right? Jesus, Jesus, just here, he's right there in the room. He didn't need the stone rolled away to get out. Uh, it was a very different kind of resurrected body than like other people who rose from the dead earlier in scripture. Jesus has a different kind of body. And so he said, they think he's a ghost, but then Watch this part. This is kind of crazy. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? See, Jesus knows us. Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When, they, when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? Why do you think that? Was he hungry? I mean, maybe. I think maybe it was because he wanted to show them, look, I'm not a ghost. And so it says they gave him a piece of broiled fish. He ate it in their presence. There's a lot of detail here. It's not just a fried fish. It's not just a fish. It's a broiled fish. You know, this is something that really happened. And they saw it and they, they died for it ultimately because they, they saw the risen Lord and he wasn't just a ghost and he wasn't a disembodied spirit. He had a resurrected body. And Paul says we will all have bodies like him. We will be resurrected. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says. And there will be, you, you will have, your old body is gone and you have, will have a new body. Now it sounds fantastic or, you know, it's, it's hard to believe. Jesus said to him, you know, you, why do doubts rise up in your minds? But if you really think about it, I mean, God created all matter and energy and all everything ever, anyway, right? And the stuff that you study in physics class is pretty mind-blowing. Like, like, okay, this table is all really just empty space. It's just, it's just mathematical laws that kind of hold these particles together, and it feels like it's real, but it's not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you really start thinking about some of that stuff, even gravity, why does gravity work? I don't know, it just does, but you can't really explain why. God made it. So if God made all of that, can't he make a new heavens and new earth? Can't he make a new resurrected form? Can't he do something outside our dimension or whatever he wants to do? And, and, and so it's, you know, in one, one sense we go, well, it's, people will be like, oh, the resurrection from the bo bodily resurrection. I don't know. Jesus was just a good teacher. He was a, a kind sage or whatever they say about him, but they don't want to believe in the resurrected Lord. And yet people believe in all kinds of wacky other things. And this is the author of life. And, and I like that he even spent 40 days with them. It wasn't like they saw him once. Uh, over a month, just to make sure, okay, they really got it. He is here. He is in bodily form. And, and we are all going to be like him someday. He's coming back. And there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. So Philippians 3 says our bodies will be like his. Second Corinthians, if you can read this, says, For we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed... That, that, that's what happens to all of us. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Like Sean was sharing, I feel a little jealous. I, there's something that's not right here. I'm getting, you know, and, and as we grow older, we feel this more because our, our earthly body, I was just talking to my mom, I called her on her birthday. Excuse me. She was born in 1948. And she said, she said, I don't understand. I just keep getting, you know, there's a new number every year, but I don't feel any older. She said, I feel like just the same old, you know, I feel like the same 25-year-old person. 
It's just that my body is getting old. She, she was like, do you feel that way? And I'm like, yes, I feel that way. Because <laughs> uh, this, e- this is a tent. It's not supposed to be forever. Verse 3, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who's fashioned us for this very purpose is God. That's why God made you was so that you could become an eternal you. If you choose to follow him, if you choose to accept him, if you choose to to, to, to become a follower of Jesus. That's the whole reason we're here, is so that we can have that future. Right? Doesn't that verse say that? Yeah. For this very purpose. And He's given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So the Holy Spirit leading us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, as we talked about at midweek a couple weeks ago, that is all just pointing us forward to that new bodily reality. Right now we're just in a tent. So that's why it doesn't make any sense to put all this time and effort and energy into that tent. Or here's the thing that, that's huge, is that what Satan does, I think, even with this, this Christian idea of a, of, a, of a disembodied spiritual reality, kind of like Star Trek, that doesn't feel that inspiring. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't, I don't really want to just be like this floating, Ooh, you know, that's just so smart, but doesn't do anything. You know what I mean? Uh, a brain in a, in a you know, bat of whatever, like on Star Trek. I don't want to be that. And so there's this mentality in the world of this is all there is. And so I don't want to miss out. I got to be able to do this. I got to be able to do that. You have this bucket list. I got to go here. I got to go there. I got to learn to do this. I got to learn to do that. I got to take this class. I got to take that class. I gotta, and, and there's all this, there's this race. I got to get all this stuff done here because bef- then it's all over. And then I get to be a disembodied spirit. And that's not true. What's more real, a tent or a house? What's more real, mortal or immortal? You know, and, 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 and so this is just a tent existence. Now, some of us have better tents than others, you know? <laughs> like, this is my tent. This is a, this is a Steve Marici tent. <laughs> you know, he's got a little nicer body than I do. Uh, but it's still just a tent. You know, we're talking about a house, a house, Paul says. That's the future. So that's why it's so foolish to do things in this life that, that could ever, you know, take this away. Yes. You know, that's why it's so foolish to focus on things that aren't about this, that aren't about our heavenly home, that aren't about what really, really matters. We face a physical future. There's a, a quote from C.S. Lewis. There is no use trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. He likes matter. He invented it. And he goes on to say that's why we have baptism and communion and we have something spiritual to connect us to, something physical to to connect us to the spiritual. A new car is still a car. A new body is still a body. A new earth is still an earth. And so, you know, you you remember the, the little cars the kids drive? You know, that, that, that's awesome and it's cool and it's wonderful, but it's nothing like the real thing. And so there is no, if you believe this, then there is no fear of missing out. Because the future reality is going to be way better. If you think about the best things that this world has to offer. I mean, the, the most pure and wonderful and amazing and awesome, you know, the, the beautiful vistas that you see up in the mountains. Or, or special time with your spouse, sexual intimacy. Uh, the, the, the camaraderie we feel with each other. All of that is just pointing us towards a future, rea- future reality that's way better. It's just like this car versus the, you know, it's a BMW. <laughs> you know, but versus the real BMW. There, there's a huge, huge difference. Uh, I was in, uh, in San, uh, San Antonio. We had our big conference, you know, a few years ago. We're doing another one in 2016 next summer in, in St. Louis. And so I was there this, this week, uh, Monday through Wednesday, looking at the space and figuring it out. And, and uh, you know, we're going to be in this stadium. It's, it's uh, a do- the dome there. It holds like 25,000 people. It holds, I think, 30,000 people, but they're expecting 20, 25,000 people to be there. And it's one of those moments that that's what it is. It's pointing you towards the future reality when you're with thousands and thousands of people there worshiping God it's just going to be amazing and so 
I was just thinking about that and how awesome heaven's going to be. And so after we saw the, the space and we were in there, we, we made a recording of the theme song in there, just kind of an unplugged thing just to get people excited about it. But we went to this restaurant in St. Louis afterwards. It's called Bailey's Range. And I had these French fries that they were made with cheese and barbecued pork and jalapenos. And I was like, I never thought of that. And this is the most amazing thing I've ever eaten in my life. I mean, it was just incredible. And I was like, and so we'd been talking about heaven and that kind of stuff. And I was like, this is just like a foreshadowing of the future reality to come. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm, I'm out of time here. just want to show you a couple pictures. And then, you know, where do people go on vacation? Nobody goes, I want to be in as much concrete as possible. <laughs> you know, they, you want to get out, right? You want to get out to the, to the beach or to the, to the, to the mountains. Or, or, you know, you want to get out in nature. God created us for that. And so when God says he's going to make a new earth, Think about how amazing that's going to be. This is a picture of Encinitas, you know, and I was walking on the beach just like, oh, this is awesome. But that's just look, looking forward. When we were in Colorado, we had worship service. With, we had, Denver Church was in house churches, and uh, we were, they ended up having a house church the week we were there uh, up on Lookout Mountain. It's like 10 minutes from where, my parent, where Dessa's parents live in Evergreen. So that's where we had church, right there, looking out over the range. It was just incredible. But all of that is just pointing towards forever, pointing towards the future. Paul says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What, Paul says, our current sufferings are light and momentary troubles. What light and momentary troubles was Paul talking about? Well, he was shipwrecked. He was you know, he was stoned. He was hit with rocks. A whole crowd gathers around him and they throw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. And then he passed out. They think he's dead. They leave and he gets up and walks back in. The, you know, he was, he was flogged five times, 39 lashes, you know, on, the, on his back, just left in ribbons. He, he, he said, I bear on my, on my body the marks of Jesus. You know, his whole body was scarred and disfigured. I mean, he went through some tough stuff. He says, that's all just light and momentary troubles. Because Paul is a guy who had been able to, he'd been allowed to see the future. He'd been allowed to see that, that future reality. And he says, that's like, it's like nothing. It's not even, Romans says, it's not even worth comparing. In that same passage where he says, it's not even worth comparing. He says, in my opinion, we may have to go through, whatever we have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has in store for us. That's what Paul said. And I love this part. He says, the whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming in, into their own. All, the curse of Adam and Eve, the curse that we all are living under, it's, it's everywhere. But then God is going to renew all things. And as far as the curse is found, like we sing, that's how far God will renew. That all of, all of creation will be renewed. And so uh, to close here, three things to, to kind of take home from this as far as practicals. Number one, perspective have a daily perspective of what really matters. Fix your eyes on Jesus and what is unseen. Have eyes of faith, daily decisions, daily effort to focus on what really matters, to have that godly perspective. Don't allow yourself to get like the texting while you walk kind of spiritual perspective, but get your perspective right. Don't be controlled by fear of missing out. Priority. You know, th there is nothing more important than being with God forever. He says, you were made for that purpose. So don't ever, 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 ever quit. That's the only way you can miss out is if you quit. Amen, right? If you keep going, he's pursuing you by his love, remember? Yeah. So as long as you keep going, you're going to make it. Just don't ever quit. Protect your inter eternal investment. Protect your soul. You know, we, we put things on our, I mean, I have a case on my iPhone here. We, we protect our stuff, yeah. but we don't protect our souls sometimes with what we watch, with who we hang out with, with decisions we make, with how we spend our time. we got to protect that eternal investment that Holy Spirit is in us as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. we got to protect that and keep the right priority. Purpose, finally. You know, uh, Randy Alcorn says, we are made for a person and we're made for a place. That person is Jesus and that place is heaven. 
And we read that, that, that God made us for that very purpose. And so that's not true just of you. That's true of everyone around you. And so when you share your faith, you're trying to connect them with their true purpose. You're not trying to sell them something. You're not trying to talk them into something. And sometimes we kind of feel that way. Oh, I don't want to, you know, when, in our, when we were talking uh, before we had worship, uh, our worship team rehearsal, Pat said, you know, thinking about Scott and how Scott's passed on. He said, what if the person who shared with him hadn't shared with him? You know, his finishing strong, it, it, it's all about the faith that he had and the decision he made to follow Jesus. And he finished strong. But what if that person hadn't shared their faith with him? Pat goes, I got to share my faith more because I'm not trying to talk people into things or I'm not trying to sell people's shoes. You know, I'm trying to connect them with their eternal purpose. And so seeing your suffering in terms of God's purpose and not just, I'm just suffering, but this is leading me towards forever. That, that scripture we read said, these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. So the hardships we go through in this life, sometimes they're there allowed by God so that we'll make it. Yeah. You know, if everything went my way, I would not make it. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if life was just easy and comfortable and I never had to, everything just went smoothly, I, I would probably not follow God. But those hardships, those difficulties that keep me where I need to be so that I can make it to my my purpose. You know, uh, we're going to sing a song here to close uh, that I I wrote. And um, I wrote it a while back, but I kind of finished it up. And working on this lesson inspired me to finish this song. And then I wrote the song and finished it before I even heard the news about Scott. But Scott was somebody who what an example of finishing strong. You know, when I, when I would visit him, I'm sure many of you can share this. When I'd visit him in the hospital, I was always so convicted yeah. by his outlook. Yeah. And uh, I remember visiting him at, at the City of Hope uh, there, and, and he was like, he, he goes, you know, I just realized that I've just been, I've allowed way too much sin in my life, and I should, you know, and, and I should just be way more open. And he was just super open about everything. And uh, I, you know, he goes, why was I ever prideful? You know, I was just convicted like, man, that's so true. Uh, why am I ever prideful? And, and, and he apologized to me because he said, I just want to apologize to you because uh, I feel like I didn't really value what you do as far as worship, you know, writing songs and writing worship songs. And he said, those have really helped me, really ministered to me. And, and uh, I just want to apologize because I just thought, oh, it's just kind of fluff part of the worship service. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, it sounds like Scott. He's a little, little sarcastic. Uh, but, man, it just convicted me. I thought, man, I want to have that kind of heart that I don't leave anything, you know, anything. T- t- like like Sean, Sean said, I, I, I don't leave any issues between people. I, I, I don't leave anything unconfessed. I just want to stay open and have that perspective that, that what really matters really matters. And so this song, uh, you'll catch on right away. It's called The Other Side. And uh, we're going to sing this song together to close out our service, and we'll be be dismissed after we sing this song together. Thanks for listening to the South Bay Church Podcast. For other sermons, videos, upcoming events, and more about our church, please visit southbaychurch.us.